Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and this lecture pertains to the consultative hematology chapter of Hematology and Transfusion Medicine Board Review Made Simple. Anemia in the newborn. Due to the hypoxic nature of intrauterine environment, newborns are relatively polycythemic with mean hemoglobin of 19. Think of anemia in newborns as you do in adults. Blood loss versus increased destruction versus hypoproduction. First, blood loss. Could be due to placenta preview or, or eruption. Could be due to rupture of umbilical cord, fetal maternal hemorrhage, to see the Kleihar Becky test on maternal blood in which fetal cells are resistant to elution of hemoglobin in an acid medium. Could be due to intracranial hemorrhage. Think of it in the lethargic baby whose mother had refused vitamin K injections. Or twin twin transfusion syndrome. Can have up to five grams difference in hemoglobin between twins with monocordial placenta. Next, hemolytic anemia. Could be due to inherited abnormality of RBC membrane, such as hereditary spherocytosis, or glucose 6-phosphatase dehydrogenase deficiency, and will have higher than expected jaundice in those newborns. <clears throat> or, alternately, immune-mediated maternal IgG, passively trans transferred via the placenta. So check the RH status of the infant and mother and perform direct Combs test. Check ABO incompatibility, can be seen in A-type infant and O-type mother in which mother will have anti-A antibodies. Also DAC infection and sepsis and acidosis. Next, hypoproduction anemia. Could be diamond blackfin anemia. Abnormally low reticulocyte count. Look for limb abnormalities and mutation in ribosomal enzyme S19. And lastly, Fanconi's anemia. Patient will be pancytopenic and check for abnormal chromosomal breakage in cultures, lymphocytes, and DB or mitomycin. Neutropenia in the newborn. First, transient neutropenia of newborn. Seen in neonates whose mother had pregnancy induced hypertension. Two, neonatal allomine neutropenia due to transplacental passage of maternal antibodies which react with paternal antigens on the neutrophils. Confirmed by checking antigenic differences between maternal and paternal neutrophils, NA1 and NA2. Can cause severe neutropenia and sepsis, but usually resolves within a few weeks. Next, autoimmune neutropenia. Neonate develops autoantibodies against neutrophil antigens. More of a nine course than neonatal alloimmune neutropenia, and they consider GCSF. Other congenital disorders such as congenital neutropenia, schwachmann bodium diamond syndrome, and glycogen storage disease. <clears throat> Thrombocytopenia in the neonate. Most important question, is a neonate toxic or not? In the newborn period, consider congenital diseases, congenital infections, alloimmune or autoimmune thrombocytopenia, and with delayed onset, consider sepsis, DIC, growing hemangiomas, necrotizing enterocolitis, and HIT. Very important, healthy newborn infant with thrombocytopenia, but mother with normal platelet count. Think NATE, neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. Due to passively transmitted maternal IgG via the placenta, which react with paternal antigens on the platelet surface. Similar to RH disease for RBCs, but it may occur in the first pregnancy and can get worse with subsequent pregnancies. <clears throat> Again, due to maternal antibody against the HPA1 antigen, this is a very important antigen to know because this will also cause post-transfusion purpura, as we'll find out later. Check mother's sisters for anti-HPA antibodies as it may also inflict their children as well. Diagnosis is confirmed if antibodies against paternal platelets are identified in the mother. Treatment, transfusion is uh, transfusion of HPA compatible platelets or washed maternal collective platelets, IVIG as well as steroids. Coagulopathy in the newborn. Neonates have physiologically low vitamin K dependent factors, 2, 7, 9, 10. Up to a third of severe hemophilia A neonates represents new mutations, so there could be no family history. 
The patient has delayed umbilical cord bleeding, think factor 13 deficiency. If neonate who had quote unquote natural birth presents with intracranial bleed, think vitamin K deficiency from parents having refused vitamin K injection. Thrombosis in the newborn. Neonates have very low physiologic protein CS and plasminogen levels, which renders them more hypercoagulable. If neonate presents with intrauterine ophthalmic or cerebral thrombosis, then think homozygous protein CRS deficiency. The treatment for protein C deficiency without a DVT would be FFP for six weeks and protein C concentrate 100 units per kgbid. The treatment of DVT in the neonate would be low molecular weight heparin at 1.7 mg per kg Q12. Remember the adult is 1 mg per kg, so higher dose and you may check levels, anti 10 levels, and you would, would like the 10 levels between, to be between 0.5 and 1. Iron deficiency anemia in children. 15 month old female presenting with lethargy, occult blood and stool, and eosinophilia. Recently, mother changed child's diet from iron fortified formula to cow's milk. Patient with low hemoglobin, which is microcytic, low iron, and decreased ferritin. Iron deficiency is common at age one to two. At one year of life, children typically switch from iron fortified formulas to iron poor cow's milk, so be careful. Low serum iron, occult blood and stool, or eosinophilia may raise concern for intolerance of cow's milk in an infant. So a child must take adequate dietary iron supplements. Lupus anticoagulant in children. There's three scenarios in which children may have lupus anticoagulant. One, child with thrombosis who has positive lupus anticoagulant. That's simple, treatment anticoagulation. Two, this is very important. Children with unexpected bleeding with elevated prothrombin time. 50-50 mixing study with antiphospholipid neutralization reveals a lupus anticoagulant as well as low factor two activity. Extremely important to know. Lupus anticoagulant can actually cause increased clearance of factor two and render one a bleeder, not a clotter. Treatment for this would be immunosuppression. Three, routine pre-op screening in which a child is found to have elevated PTT and workup reveals lupus anticoagulant, usually due to preceding infection and of no clinical significance. Treatment, none. <clears throat> Perioperative assessment of bleeding risk. Most important and relevant pre-op assessment necessary to determine the risk of bleeding is a detailed personal and family history, not bleeding time or platelet function analyzers. Start with a simple PT, PTT, and platelet count, and a good history. General recommendations prior to surgery would be one INR less than 1.5, next fibrinogen more than one grams per liter, and platelets over 50,000 or over 100,000 for neurosurgery. And if platelets are below 50,000 for ITD, that's fine, as long as they're above 10,000. Stop aspirin one week before, except for simple surgeries such as cataract, or simple dental extractions or dermatologic procedures in which it is not necessary to stop aspirin. Stop clopidogrel at least five days before surgery, but prefer 10 if possible. Outpatient taking Coumadin. Recommendations would be to stop Coumadin four days before surgery and bridge with low molecular weight heparin. And stop low molecular weight heparin 24 hours before surgery and reinitiate Coumadin 24 hours after the procedure. If patient, if patient is in the hospital on intravenous unfractionated heparin, Stop six hours before procedure, and if emergent procedure is required, you may reverse with protamine sulfate. Now, with perioperative or intraoperative bleeding, assess PT, PTT, fibrinogen, and platelet count. If all normal, then most likely inadequate local hemostasis is the problem, so surgeon needs to re explore. Uh, hematologic issues to consider when patient bleeding excessively intraoperatively are one, Unrecognized factor 11 deficiency, so check factor 11. Unrecognized momilibrine deficiency, so check momilibrine factor, antigen, activity, multimers, and RIPA. Hypothermia, so warm saline and bear huggers. Hyperfibrinolysis, check fibrinogen level. Antiplatelet medicine, 
which the patient was taking before the operation. So retake detailed history from the family. DIC, so check PT, PTT, fibrinogen, and examine the smear for, uh, for schistocytes. Dilutional coagulopathy, check PT, PTT, platelet count, and suspect if patient has received more than 10 units of blood. And metabolic acidosis, so check the pH level on, on ABG. The treatment would be SFP, cryoprecipitate, platelet transfusions, correct hypothermia, correct acidosis, fibrin glue for local hemostasis, DDAVP patient uremic, aminocaproic acid, or if patients are really bleeding, then consider recombinant factor 7 or FIBA. For local bleeding after dental extraction, may use fibrin sealant and or aminocaproic acid rinse. Post-op bleeding. If non-hypothermic, non-acidotic patient bleeding with quote-unquote bright red blood with normal PT, PTT platelets, they need to return to the operating room for exploration. But if patient is quote-unquote oozing post-operatively, then must rule out mammillibrand disease, platelet dysfunction, coagulation factor, and our fibrinogen factor deficiency. Again, if it's post-op bleeding, they can then consider FFP, prior precipitate, platelet transfusions, correct hypothermia, correct acidosis, fibrin glue, DDAVP, if patient uremic, amicar, and recombinant factor 7 or 5 if patient severely bleeding. Anemia in the ICU setting. Take home, do not transfuse liberally. This is a very important landmark study called the Transfusion Requirements in Critical Care, the TRIC trial. In this trial, patients in the intensive care were either transfused to hemoglobin above 10 or kept at 7 to 9.9. Actually, patients who maintained lower hemoglobin had lower in-hospital mortality. Also, erythropoietin stimulating agents have not proven beneficial either. Thrombocytopenia in the ICU setting. Very simple. Most likely either sepsis-related or drug-induced. Also consider ITP, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, antiphospholipid syndrome, or TTP. Deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. High risk for orthopedic procedures or any other surgical procedure lasting more than 30 minutes. Head surgery, prefer to initiate DVT prophylaxis two to six hours post-operation. Continue at least 7 to 10 days or 28 days if patient will be immobile. Fondoparinox, which is a subcutaneous direct thrombin inhibitor, epixaban, oral tenay inhibitor approved in Europe, may be used as well as subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. <clears throat> Elevated INR while patient on Coumadin treatment recommendations. If the INR is between 3 and 5, then lower Coumadin dose. If it's between 5 and 10, hold 1 or 2 doses, then reduce dose. If it's more than 10, the patient not bleeding, administer 2.5 PO vitamin K and decrease dose. Bleeding with any INR, administer vitamin K IV, 10, FFP, factor 7 if needed. Big take home, do not recommend subcutaneous vitamin K as the absorption is very low. Post-organ transplantation consultations. Common consult, cytopenia following organ transplantation for patient on immunosuppressants. Must rule out cyclosporin-induced thrombotic microangiopathy causing anemia thrombocytopenia. Oftentimes, it's very difficult to distinguish between TTP versus kidney graft rejection, so we'll need a renal biopsy to differentiate between the two. If TTP is diagnosed, then stop cyclosporin and initiate tacrolimus instead for immune suppression. Pregnancy. <clears throat> During normal pregnancy, the plasma volume expands by 40 to 60 percent, which causes relative anemia and thrombocytopenia. Anemia is tolerated well and does not become a problem unless hemoglobin is less than 6. If hemoglobin is less than 10 in pregnant women, then you need to investigate. Anemia is usually related to iron or folate deficiency, so replace with supplements. Thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. Number one, Incidental thrombocytopenia, case report. 30-year-old female, G3P2, and third trimester of a normal pregnancy with asymptomatic thrombocytopenia. The thrombocytopenia did not precede her pregnancy, this is very important to know, versus ITP, which usually would precede the pregnancy. 
It has been in normal range in the first trimester, but fell to 80,000 in the third trimester. In previous pregnancies, she did not exhibit thrombocytopenia, has never received any treatment for thrombocytopenia prior, no splenomegaly on exam, no bleeding, and normal blood morphology. Incidental thrombocytopenia usually develops during the second or third trimester in otherwise healthy pregnant women. Again, it's due to increase in plasma volume during the second and third trimester. No treatment needed. You may have vaginal delivery or C-section. The ITP in pregnancy. 30-year-old female, G3P2 presenting in the first trimester of a normal pregnancy with asymptomatic thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia preceded her pregnancy. It has been in 80,000 range in the first trimester, but fell to 55,000 in the third trimester. In previous pregnancies, the platelet did also decrease as low as 30,000. There's no splenomegaly on exam. Remember, if you see splenomegaly, there's another issue going on, not ITP. No bleeding and normal blood morphology. In pregnancy-related ITP, risk of fetus is also minimal. If intact spleen and platelet counts over 50,000. C-section is of no benefit over a vaginal delivery and decreasing rate of fetal intracranial hemorrhage, even if platelet is less than 50,000. Infants born to mothers with ITP usually have normal platelet counts, but all offspring of patients with ITP should be monitored closely for development of ITP within the first four to seven days after delivery, and all thrombocytopenic neonates should undergo a cranial ultrasound to rule out intracranial bleeding. Severely affected offspring generally respond well to IVIG. Treatment, if platelets, platelets less than 50,000, then IVIG is first line, as steroids may cause plus palate views in the first trimester. Rituximab, Otromabac, and Romiplexim are all category C, so do not use. For severe ITP, consider splenectomy. Acute fatty liver pregnancy, case report. 35-year-old female, in her third trimester with twin gestations, presenting with nausea, vomiting, retiver quadrant pain, anorexia, jaundice, cholestatic liver dysfunction, elevated PT, PTT, low fibrinogen, hemoglobin low, platelets low, elevated indirect bilirubin, and schistocyton smear. Also, sodium elevated at 148 and blood glucose low. AFLP symptoms include nausea, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and liver dysfunction. Most patients also present with, you must know this, DIC, diabetes insipidus, and hypoglycemia. Cause is unknown, but could be from fetal mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation disorders, most commonly deficiency of long chain of free hydroxyl acetyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase. Treatments stabilize mother and deliver the fetus if possible. Bomilibrand disease in pregnancy. Case report. 24-year-old female with known type 2A bomilibrand disease. Baseline pre-pregnancy bomilibrand resistance activity at 20%. Delivers a full-term infant at 36 weeks via vaginal delivery without any complications. Bomilibrand activity the day prior to delivery was 60% and factor 8 activity was 65%. Therefore, no DDAVP or bomilibrand factor slash factor 8 were recommended. Three days postpartum, however, she begins to have diffuse vaginal bleeding. But milibrand activity at day three postpartum is now 20% and factor rate is 20%. What happened? Very important to know. Under the regulation of elevated estrogen levels that occur in pregnancy, the levels of bumilibrand factor and factor rate increase, generally beginning in the early second trimester and peaking between 29 and 35 weeks. Many patients will normalize their hormone factor level during pregnancy, but it may drop precipitously postpartum with falling estrogen levels. The physiologic increase on the hormone factor levels exceeds the minimum 50% recommended for epidural anesthesia and delivery, so allows these procedures to be performed without therapeutic intervention. Very, very important to know, must continue checking hormone factor antigen and activity levels postpartum as they may fall very quickly, requiring treatments with TDAVP or molar blood factor slash factor rate transfusions. Pregnancy-induced preeclampsia. 20-year-old African-American female in 30th week of pregnancy complains of headaches, right of quadrant pain, 
blood pressure very elevated, enlarged from the edema, normal uterine size. Negative abdominal exam, hemoglobin 8, platelets 50,000, cluster protein on UA, one schistocyte per six high power fields. Remember, you need at least one per high power field in DIC or TTP. Creatinine elevated, indirect bilirubinemia, ASD elevated, LDH, PT, PTD, fibrinogen, all normal. Preeclampsia syndrome consists of hypertension, edema, and proteinuria in the third trimester. May appreciate mild anemia and thrombocytopenia and mild schistocytes on smear, but in this case, the LDH is normal, so there's no need for plasmapheresis since it rules out TTP. Only if patient has high LDH should you consider plasma exchange for TTP. Treatment, magnesium sulfate to reduce blood pressure and deliver infinite safe. Health syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. 25-year-old female presenting with fiber quadrant pain, nausea, hypertension, elevated ACT and ALT, hemoglobin 7, elevated retic count, LDH elevated, and platelets low at 80,000. Peripheral smear with schistocytes present. PT, PTT, and creatinine normal, so not on DIC. The major diagnostic criteria for health include microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, levels of serum aspartic aminotransferase exceeding 70, and thrombocytopenia, platelets less than 100. Microangiopathic hemolysis manifests as schistocytes on the peripheral blood film and elevated LDH. Treatment would be stabilized mother and delivery of infant. Be watchful and cautious as symptoms may actually worsen post delivery. DIC in pregnancy. Typical causes would be preeclampsia, retained fetal products, placental abruption, amniotic fluid embolization, acute fatty liver pregnancy. Treatment would be treating the underlying cause and support with SFP and cryo patient bleeding. TTP and HUS. Discussion much more detail in the hemolytic anemia chapter, but know that there's a higher incidence in pregnancy. Treatment of TTP in pregnancy would be plasmapheresis. Treatment of HUS in pregnancy, as we all know, echolizumab has just been approved for HUS. However, it's category C and is not indicated in pregnancy. So HUS in pregnancy, is, the treatment will be supportive care. Prognosis is actually quite poor. Thrombophilia in pregnancy. Pregnancy is an acquired hypercoagulable state due to increase in coagulation factors. So we'll have increased risk of both arterial and venous thrombosis. Many other thromboembolic events that occur in pregnant women are associated with a thrombophilic disorder, either known or unknown. 50% of pulmonary embolites during pregnancy occur actually during delivery. Pregnancy-associated DVT is more often proximal and massive than in non-pregnant setting, and usually occurs in the left lower extremity due to left iliac vein compression. Remember, if suspect DVT and lower extremity ultrasound is negative, then repeat it several days later. If want to roll out PE, then obtain VQ scan, which is safe. Treatment: Oral vitamin K antagonists are triogenic, so do not use during pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Long-term use of unfractionated heparin during pregnancy has been associated with osteoporosis. So use low molecular weight heparin and may convert to IV unfractionated heparin to be right before delivery and convert to Coumadin for six weeks postpartum. <clears throat> Other anticoagulation scenarios with pregnancy. If the patient's had a prior venothrombotic event, VTE, with associated risk factor at the time, that antipartum close observation. Postpartum will need VTE prophylaxis. If there's a history of one VTE and no thrombophilia, then antipartum may either observe or consider VTE prophylaxis. Postpartum, definite VTE prophylaxis. If there's a history of one VTE and confirmed thrombophilia, then both antipartum and postpartum need VTE prophylaxis. If there's no history of VTE but confirmed thrombophilia, then both antipartum and postpartum need VTE prophylaxis. If patients are already on anticoagulation prior to pregnancy, then antipartum, full treatment with low molecular weight heparin, postpartum, resume Coumadin. Hematologic malignancies in pregnancy. Case report. 34-year-old female in her second trimester of pregnancy diagnosed with AML. Treat or not to treat. Take home. Do not use chemotherapy in the first trimester. 
acceptable to administer chemotherapy in the second or third trimester, however. Also, CAT scan and PET scans are not to be used on pregnant women, but MRIs and ultrasounds are acceptable. Prosthetic heart valve in pregnancy, case report. 34-year-old female with prosthetic mitral valve on Coumadin wishes to become pregnant. How to anticoagulate her during pregnancy? Both unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin have high rate of breakthrough thrombosis associated with them in the setting of prosthetic heart valves, so Coumadin is a preferred treatment of anticoagulation. However, Coumadin is associated with embryopathy when administered between 6 and 12 weeks of pregnancy, so consider use of unfractionated heparin during that time. Superficial vein thrombosis. If not in the proximity of deep vein thrombosis, then warm compresses and NSAIDs. If in proximity of deep vein thrombosis, then anticoagulation for four weeks. Calf venous thrombosis. If no contraindication for anticoagulation, then anticoagulate. If patient has contraindication for anticoagulation, then monitor for one week. If no progression, no need to anticoagulate. If progression, need to anticoagulate or place IUC filter. Contraindications to anticoagulation, high risk falls, spinal anesthesia and lumbar punctures, recent major operation, underlying coagulopathy, platelet count less than 50,000, platelet dysfunction, recent intracranial or GI bleed or spinal lesion at risk for bleed. Therapeutic anticoagulation treatment for venous thromboembolism, fragment, Delta parent at 200 units per kg sub-Q daily, and oxaparent, 1 milligram per kilogram sub-Q BID, tendaparent, 175 units per sub-Q BID, daily, I apologize, fondaparent ox, patients less than 50 kilograms and 5 milligram, if between 50 and 100 kilograms, sub-0.5 milligram, if more than 100 kilograms, then 10 milligram, Coumadin, goal INR 2 and 3, IV unfractionated heparin, 80 units per kg load, then 18 units per kg per hour, target PTT two times normal. Remember, low molecular weight heparin and fondaparinox are contraindicated in patients with creatinine clearance less than 30. This concludes the consultative hematology chapter. Thank you.